Can adversity truly become a stepping stone to a life filled with purpose and abundance? In this captivating episode, Gul Khan, a money mindset expert, shares her transformative journey from dyslexia and adversity to becoming a successful millionaire. Join us on this exploration of self-discovery and success. Would you like to think and grow rich? If so, keep on listening. This podcast is dedicated to those who have found their way from fear to freedom and for those who are considering undertaking this amazing journey. This is the Courage to Be podcast, and I am your host, Tanya Vasayo. Before we get into this episode, I'm thrilled to share that I'm hosting a series on how people's lives have been influenced by the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you'd like to learn and apply how to think and grow rich, go to the show notes to get some wonderful free resources and join the Courage to Be community. I look forward to being your guide and mentor so you can transform your life. Welcome back to The Courage to Be, where we have powerful conversations to transform your life and your business. And we are continuing with the Think and Grow Rich series based off of the book of Napoleon Hill. And today we have Gul Khan with us, who's a money mindset mentor. Welcome, Gul. Thank you so much for having me, Tanya. I'm super excited to be here. Yes, please share with us. I mean, this book, Think and Grow Rich, has made so many millionaires, and I know that's your area of expertise, you know, money, yeah. money blocks, money mindset, and there's so many, I think we can track back, I have to look at this statistic, but it's made over a million millionaires, you know, of just reading this book. It's the second most sold book in the history of books after the Bible. So share with us. What has been your journey with Think and Grow Rich? When was the first time you got exposed to this book? Well, thank you so much for asking that. That's an amazing question. So let me introduce who I am. So I am a money mindset expert and I help entrepreneurs to break free from the LinkedIn beliefs and reverse their money chain using energy tools for abundance. And I have multiple businesses. I think the question is so close to my heart because my introduction to the world of personal development came through Tony Robbins, like I think the vast majority of our generation. And I was looking for a book by Tony Buzan and I found a book by Tony Robbins and that took me down the rabbit hole. Now from Tony Robbins, I went on to Jim Rowan, who was his mentor and Bob Proctor. And from Jim Rowan, I found Bob Proctor and Bob Proctor is the one who introduced me to Think and Grow Rich. And he had a series back while, I think he must have done it in the 80s, way before I think I was still a baby then, but it was on, you know, it was, you were born rich. It was his seminar and I bought that seminar. So I bought that, you know, and I got literally him in this brown suit, really skinny in the old eighties, you know, that yeah, I'm sure you know about that one, right? Yeah, you were born rich seminar. So I bought that and that whole seminar was based around think and grow rich. So my first introduction to the principles of Napoleon Hill, we came through Bob Proctor. And the reason why I think this is so uh, profound is because Bob Proctor, I mean, he rest in peace. I treat him as a mentor, even though I never got you know, a coaching program directly, but I treat him as a mentor because he introduced me to so many of these concepts, which I've now developed and I teach myself. It's, he said that, everything is energy and the way he described it he described it in a way that it was he made it simple so everything became a plus b plus c and that was Bob Proctor's way of explaining things to someone a novice like me I was in my I must have been my early 20s at the time it became very easy for me to understand and then when I read the book it's I actually read the book after so I, I did the course first and I read his book after and I had to read the book you know by thinking grow rich and the principles in there just really shot at me. And just a quick background, I grew up in the, what would you call it? The ghettos of London. I grew up in East London, council estate in East London. My brother was in and out of juvie, whatever, you know, doing whatever. And I am severely dyslexic, which I didn't know until I was a first year of my law degree. So I, you know, and the reason why I went down looking for Tony Busan's book is because I found out I'm dyslexic and I was trying to work out why am I successful, why, you know, and how to be more successful. So when I looked at the principles in Think and Grow Rich, I could understand how, not intentionally, but unintentionally, I had lined up with a lot of those principles. And that's why I was successful. So it gave, that was a, so Bob Proctor and Think and Grow Rich gave me the explanation that I was looking for all this time. Why had I been successful and others not? But it also allowed me to set my sights really high. 
And therefore I set myself a target of becoming a millionaire before I was 30. I hit that target at 27. So got someone who grew up in a council estate with a very little, as a dyslexic person, put myself through school and, and college and whatever have you. And my mom passed away. And mom, or something else I should add is because my whole life revolved around my mom, who was a single parent. She passed away when I was 21. So right in the middle of my law degree, I picked myself up and carried on, finished my degree and then carried on and became a lawyer thereafter. But all of these things didn't stop me from becoming, you know, getting to those material worth, I would say. I think I have a lot more lofty goals now. At that time, being young, I just had the material goals. And I hit those material goals very, very quickly. And I would say if it wasn't for Bob Proctor and Thinking Grow Rich, I would not be here. Wow. There's so many questions I want to ask you about this story because you condensed it and you summarized it. And I'm like, well, wait, how did you become a millionaire, you know, at 27? And what did you put in place? But let's pause. Let's take a breath here. And what principles, as you're looking back now in hindsight, do you think that you were applying indirectly or like Bob Proctor calls it the unconscious competent. You know, I feel the same way, you know, like there's a lot of successes that I've achieved in my life and I've kind of wanted to understand it so that you can learn because when you understand yourself, you can teach it to other people. And that's where I felt like, oh, I've been an unconscious competent, but yes, I applied this principle and this principle and this principle, like there is a methodology, there is a formula, like you're saying, what principles do you think you applied to reach that, you know, all those material goods that you wanted, becoming a millionaire, reaching those goals that you set yourself out to, what were you applying that you had no idea about, but that you can see now with time? So one of the striking things that came to me when I read the book, and it wasn't something that the Bob Proctor told, this is actually when you read the book, you find out. And that's when Napoleon Hill was telling you the story of how he decided to come and you know do this book and write this book and how it's going to take him 20 years and how he built up the confidence to be able to write this book. And he said he goes, he went in front of the mirror for 30 days and every day he'd say, I'm going to go, you know, Mr. Carnegie, I'm going to be better person than you. I'm going to be bigger person than you and all of that stuff, right? And I kid you not, okay, the way I built my confidence to say that I could do, because remember, as a dyslexic student, I couldn't even read a full sentence till I was about 11, 12 years old. So I had people who were far smarter than me, but I believed I was very smart. I was never in competition with anybody else. I always believed I was the smartest person I knew. That's it. It wasn't anybody else. It was just me. I'm the smartest person I knew. And it wasn't the case, I promise you. <laughs> but I convinced myself. And the way I did it was in the mirror. So I remember before my GCSEs, before my A-levels, before my a any exam, anything big that would have to happen, I would go to the mirror and say, you know, cool, you can do this. You're this and this. And I didn't know this was a, a technique that anybody else used. And I really connected with Napoleon Hill. And when I saw he did the same thing, I'm like, oh my God, I was doing this already. So he used it to build confidence. And that's what I did. And I really believe you have to believe in yourself before it can happen, before you can make it happen. And I had no one around me telling me that I was clever. I have always been, you know, I've been pretty, but, you know, people have said, oh, you know, you've got a pretty face. It, acknowledging the fact that I have a brain wasn't as forthcoming. My mother, I have to say, I God bless her, you know, may she rest in peace. She always had believed that I was really pretty and I was really intelligent. I always got that from my mom, but nobody else. My teachers didn't believe in me. I remember having doing five A levels, and my vice principal pulled me in and said, told me to drop one of the subjects, and I said no, and because normally people do three or four maximum, I was doing five, and he said, well, I don't think you can get the grades. I'm like, yes, I can. And he goes, are you sure? So we literally had an argument about it, but he, he couldn't justify me dropping because my grades were, all my exam results were up to level. So the, nothing could justify him forcing me to drop a grade. I remember thinking, I'm going to prove you wrong. I can do this. You don't believe in me. I believe in me. That's the 18, 19 year old thinking in my heart thinking, I'm going to prove you wrong. The guy was doing his job. He wasn't doing anything wrong. But I remember all throughout my life, I had people who doubted me a lot and people in authority who doubted me. And I remember now looking back at it, it was a vice principal in my college. I, I should have been intimidated. Instead, I said, no, I can do this. And I argued with him. I refused to back down. And I refused to let his doubt influence me. And that is a principle that comes from Think and Grow Rich, which I didn't know at the time. But now I know. You have to believe in yourself more than anybody else, any person in authority, any person in your family, anybody around you. If you want to do something, you have to believe it wholeheartedly, build the confidence for it. If you don't have it, 
go and get that confidence, which is talking to yourself in the mirror, doing meditation, do whatever it works, but get that confidence. And when you do, I promise you, you create miracles. And I got, by the way, I walked away with three A's and two B's, which is astonishing. And even my two B's were very, very close to A's. So I've got very, very high grades. Yet, you know, it was supposed to be impossible, for, especially for someone who's dyslexic, which I didn't know at the time, by the way. I found out once I went to university, a, a, literally a year and a bit later, that I'm, I'm dyslexic. So that's the reason why I'm struggling with actually writing stuff. This story is fascinating. And I want to dive deeper into the dyslexic part because this is huge that you intuitively were going to the mirror and just pumping yourself up, you know, like yeah. that's just one of the principles of autosuggestion, you know, and I wish they taught this at schools oh, yeah. and the kids could learn this kind of stuff. There is a video on YouTube. It just came to mind years ago of that little girl that's like five years old and she's in front of the mirror and she's like, you mm -hmm. are amazing. You that's are the it. best. Remember that yeah. one? Yeah. That's how I'm visualizing you, you know, go, you just going up to the mirror and telling yourself how amazing you are. And this for anyone that's listening, if you've never practiced mirror work and haven't done this, it will boost your confidence to a whole other level. Like Gould's saying, you know, it's like you have to believe in yourself like no one else believes in you. Because guess what? You are your biggest champion and you are your biggest coach. Like Mel Robbins says, go to the mirror, give yourself a high five. Or I like doing this. Like I'll give a speech or I finish a podcast. I'll go to the bathroom afterwards. And while I'm washing my hands, I'll look myself in the mirror and I'll say, Tanya, you were amazing. That was an awesome interview that you had. So highly, highly suggest doing this. And thank you, Gold, for telling us that story, because I think that's going to empower a lot of people with that. I want to go back a little bit with dyslexia and not finding out about it. Like what was your journey with dyslexia and how did you become a lawyer and how did you pump up your confidence? Because when you have something like this, it, it could really stop you and it could really determine uh, your life's journey. How did you do it? Or for anyone that might have some type of disability or something that they're seeing as an obstacle, especially nowadays with all these labels, you know, ADHD, dyslexia, blah, 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 you know, like all these different things. I have to say, Tanya, I'm so glad I grew up in the 80s and 90s and had my schooling, obviously, in the 90s. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be aware of it, but it's a label that I don't like. So I had no idea. Yes, I struggled. So if you are aware of it, I don't like the label, but if you're aware of it, you can support the child. And I wish I had gotten some more support when I was growing up. However, I don't know if that would have hindered me more had I known I was dyslexic when I was younger and I got the additional support because then you start clutching on the support and you stop doing things on your own. Now, because I was dyslexic and I didn't know about it, I struggled with reading, but I didn't know that that's, people didn't struggle as much. I know that I was a slow reader and I spoke extra fast because my mouth was always trying to catch up with my brain. And I was trying to do everything, you know, and my handwriting was atrocious and all of those things that I was aware of. I was constantly trying to improve my handwriting. I was constantly trying to slow down my speaking. I was constantly trying to improve my reading. So I didn't let that label hinder me because I wasn't aware of the label. And then when I went to university and I had all those, uh, the grades, I remember the person who was assessing me, he turned around, looked at me because I'm not just dyslexic. I'm severely dyslexic. And I have all sorts of things that in numbers jump around and I still can't tell the difference between my left or right. Or even now I can't tell which is left and right. I have to think about it, you know, for a couple of seconds. Okay. I eat with this hand. This must be my right hand. But I believe had I been that label being put on me when I was younger, I don't know whether a word would have worked as hard. Now, I always treat my dyslexia as a gift. Now, this comes from the thinking and true belief that I really believe the universe is always working for you, not against you. If you have something which you perceive as a disability or a hindrance, I promise you there's an equal amount of benefit in it. And this is something, again, I have to attribute to Bob Proctor because he's the first person who showed me this, that, you know, that we have this, we've heard this cliche and there's a silver lining to every cloud. But it's Rob Proctor who told me about this and who really made me feel about this. I'm going to share a story with you that I heard from his program. And keep in mind, I listened to this program about 20 odd years ago, and I still remember this story and I still share it all the time. OK, he said, if something happens in your home and you, you come back home and your house is burned down and everything you own has burned up, but there was diamonds there. And you know there was diamonds there. As soon as the fire burns, you know, calms down, as soon as it's safe enough to do so, what's the first thing you're going to do? 
You, you know your clothes are burned. You know your books are burned. What are you going to do? You can go look for those few diamonds. There's few, but you know they're well, valuable. And they're there somewhere. So you go and you find them. And they may be under a rubble. They may be something where you have difficulty finding them. Guess what? You carry on searching and digging until you find those diamonds, right? Now, if that's the case with your house burns, then what about when you have, you know, when you have adverse conditions? Something terrible happens, which I know you lose a job or something happens, you lose a business or you fail an exam or something else. Something devastating like that happens to you. Fair enough. You have to let your emotions calm down. Hence the you know fire, you know, calms down. And as soon as you're able to start searching for the benefit. And when I look back in my life, Tanya, this principle has served me so many times. It's something that he learned from Napoleon Hill. You have to look for the opposite because nothing, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if there's something which is really devastating, there's an equal amount of benefit there, but we're too busy crying over the devastation. We don't see the benefit. Now, I recently was speaking to someone and I'm going to share another story. And I mentioned to them, just passing the fact that, you know, how I got started and working in because I was a stay-at-home mom just uh, until about seven, eight years ago. And when my partner and I separated, he used a financial card as a way to for me to accept his affair and accept his the girl, his second wife and whatever have you. And I said, no, you know, I said, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't believe in polygamy. And so that's not happening. And I had to start from scratch and he really did leave me in the ledge and I had no money at all coming in. And he said, I'm so sorry. And I looked at him and thought, don't be sorry. And he said, what? And I said, don't be sorry. That was the best thing that could have happened to me. And he just, he looked at me astonished. I'm like, I wouldn't be sitting here. At that time, I'd just got an award for the deal maker of the year. And I said, I would be sitting here with you seven, eight years later, getting this award, being worth about multiple seven figures and having multiple companies with seven figures, running a podcast, running all these different companies and being very, very successful. Had that not happened to me? So why would you feel sorry for me? I don't. And I was literally said it in this way. Of course, I had to do some healing when he and I separated, of course. But I forgave him ages ago. And the lessons I learned are so valuable to me. I'm living the best life possible, meeting the most amazing people, being successful. None of that would have happened had I stayed in that marriage, had this that incident not occurred. So this, all these teachings, if you take it, if you think about it, all come back to Napoleon Hill. And I learned it from the mouth on the from the great person, Bob Proctor. Amazing. And I love your level of awareness, you know, just seeing all this like stories and how you can go back. You just have, and you're saying I'm dyslexic and I have all it, but to me, it's like, wow, you are so connected with your intuition and your level of awareness is outstanding. Let's take a moment to pause. I want to share something and we'll come right back. Are you looking for personal or professional growth? Would you like to turn this year's goals into a reality? If you answered yes, then you're going to want to go to the show notes and sign up for our four day event, the four proven principles of success. This event is free and it starts tomorrow, January 12th, and it goes until January 15th. You have all weekend to attend live or listen to the recordings. And during this event, you'll learn from experts and real people who have discovered abundance in their lives and business. You'll get to receive resources and implementation tools to further guide you in creating your dream business. And you will learn the key to attracting abundance and success into your life. You'll get to connect with like-minded individuals and be in a supportive network. So if you'd like to get access, all you have to do is get registered with the link in the show notes. And like Napoleon Hill says, a goal is a dream with a deadline. So take action and I will see you at our event. So let's go back to this with every seed of adversity carries an equal or seed of larger benefit within it, which is one of the quotes from Napoleon Hill. I might have butchered it a little bit, but that's what you heard much, from yeah. Bob Proctor. And I love that you've been carrying that throughout your life, you know, like even in, in hard moments, like a separation with the father of your kids, you know, like what can you share with us? Like, how did you interact with that situation? You said that he left or you guys broke up and you had no money. How do you start out from something like that? I mean, cause there might be people that are going through adversity right now as they're listening goal. How do you overcome that? I mean, would you sit yourself down, cry, and then be like, it's okay, you know, we're going to get out of this one. What was your process for you? Well, first of all, I, I want to put down the reason why I have and I follow these principles to the heart is because of my faith. So it doesn't matter what religion you are, or even if you don't have, have a religion, as long as you believe in higher power, 
you have faith that everything's happening for you, not to you. And this faith actually was given to me by my mother. So my mother had really strong faith and she really believed that God is always looking after you. God is always supporting. God is loving. God is not fearful. God isn't this, you know, this capricious being in the sky trying to, you know, hurt you. God is loving and is always trying to help you become a better person and helping you along. So that faith has always been there and that's been instilled to me by my mother. Now, what happened at this story, I'll, I'll share the story. So when I separated from my ex-husband uh, at the time, this was back in 2016, is I literally, I mean, I, I'll share it with you guys, the extent of it. He and I had been married and we had a very, very troublesome marriage. He had pretended to be impotent, by the way. So after my son was conceived, he pretended to be impotent so that we didn't have any marital relations. And he blamed it on me. Now, I want to just give something here it, because he's a narcissist and I want people to understand that even intelligent women and intelligent people, because this happened to men too, so let's put intelligent people, even intelligent people can be fooled and be you know, manipulated by master manipulators and narcissists are. So he had me convinced, and this is the funny part, that someone had done black magic on me, which caused him to be impotent. This sounds really absurd now, but I promise you in that setting, in that circumstances, with a number of people there, he had me convinced. Okay, so he could hurl all sorts of views at me and I would take it. So he, in that process, completely, a narcissist, as you, as you will know, completely break down your character. There, there's a lot of gaslighting involved. And I had lost all confidence in my looks. I was told I was fat, I was ugly, who would look at me. And it was my fault that he wasn't attracted to me and da 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 and whatever else. And he couldn't, and he had physical problems. And that's because me, because, you know, whatever. Everything was my fault. And I believed it. I'm sharing this with you guys, not to say, you know, poor me. I just want to make you understand where I was. The character had broken down so much that I believed all his lies and I was in this position. But God had amazing plans for me. And I'm so thankful to God the way things were done. I was in a position that I had not seen it physically. I don't think I would have left him. So I became aware of the fact that he was having an affair back in March. But I caught his messages and he convinced me again. He said, look, I'm impotent. I can't do anything. We're just sex chatting. There's nothing else going on. And I believed him, right? I believed him. But we separated to make our marriage go. Again, it was my fault. I wasn't respectful enough. I wasn't loving enough. So he moved out of the house so I could work on me and become a better wife, okay? Come August time. Now, here's, here's the beautiful part. I remember on the 30th of August, 2016, I had just taken my kids to the theme park. I came back home and I was very, very happy and content and no sadness there at all. And prior to that, I had been begging my husband to come back. I said, look, let's just try and make this marriage again. Come back home, come back, come back home. He wasn't refusing to come back home. So I remember going to bed and, and asking God, God, show me what to do. Show me what to do. And, you know, he's not coming back home. I don't know how to move forward. I, I'm lost. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. This is in the night. In the morning, I woke up with a very clear voice in my head saying, go to where he's staying. Now, he had given me his address. Go to where he's staying. And I said, well, I, and I normally wake up about six, seven o'clock. That day, I woke up at nine. God told me, you need to be you need to be there for 1030. I'm like, how can I get there? Traffic, whatever. Happened to be bank all day, so no traffic. You need to get out there and get there for 1030. I promise you, I don't know what overcame me. I threw off the blankie, put on yesterday's clothes, didn't brush my feet, didn't wash my face picked our kids in the PJs, bunged them in the car, and I drove off, right? I drove off, got to there, and his car's parked outside, so he's obviously in the uh, and has knocked on the door, no one opened the door. So then I started breaking the door down, right? Bollywood style. I literally started breaking the door down. <laughs> so when I broke up one of the glasses, he came down, just he knew I wasn't leaving. And that's when I was, I knew then that something was up. Pushed him aside, I went upstairs, and I, and I literally caught his girlfriend half naked running into the bathroom. So I literally caught him in the act. So that, I had to witness that. I had to witness that in order for me to leave that marriage. Now, people say, you know, and that's when I found out that he had been pretending and he wasn't really impotent. He was just, you know, doing all sorts of stuff outside. And thank God for that, because I mean, I was protected. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Again, I'm very, very grateful to God that I was protected because God knows what he would bring home, kind of diseases anyway. But I want to share, that's where I was. Now, when I... 2016 I still had some savings whatever when he's and I separated I filed for divorce myself and I couldn't afford an attorney so but I'm an attorney myself I just filed for divorce myself and we did it but as I was filing for the divorce he pulled the financial card because he forced me he said he wants me to accept his girlfriend I said no so he said 
no money and he he's manipulative enough to then i found out the extent of it because the business is not his name or whatever i would get nothing from the court simple as that fine so in 2016 now and this happened in august 2016 towards the december time i got myself together and i realized okay i need to go back to work the choice was going back to law which is my what i know or by then when the blessing here's the blessing i keep talking about the blessings in that marriage, when I was a stay-at-home mom, I had the first time in my life, I had the opportunity to dive into personal development, go learn different modalities, go and learn all these different things. And I had learned first of all, starting with NLP, then EFT, emotional freedom technique, then intuitive life coaching, and then medicine. I did all these different modalities. And I was practicing all of it, not to become a coach, but to actually help people with, you know, just to practice. And I found that I was really good at helping people with the money. So in the end of 2016 and beginning of 2017, I thought, well, if I can help people with their money as a pro bono, what if I took it as a business? And I took it as a business. Now, the universe actually said, yeah, really? Well done, girl. But before we do this, let's figure out all your blocks yourself. And I realized, huh? So the whole of 2000 was spent me working on my blocks. And when I say this, I'm not saying this lightly, there came a point in 2017, I think it was around February, March time, where I we were going through a divorce, all the property was locked down. So the property that I owned as well, I couldn't do anything with because it's obviously we're going through a divorce. And I wasn't able to rely on government help because I was property owner. So I didn't fall in the bracket of someone who needed any money. And I didn't have any income. I had zero income. The only money that was coming to me was child benefit, which is 137 pounds and 14 pence coming to me every four weeks. That's where I started from. Okay. My gold was sold. Everything was sold. It was just horrendous. So from that point, I started working on my money blocks. Now, how did I find about money blocks? Again, universe has a wonderful way of saying things to you. So I was speaking about my situation to my aunt. And my aunt listened to me and she said, oh my God, your mother must turn in her grave. And I said, yeah, she must do. You know, she must be very sad. She goes, no, 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 The same exact thing happened to you that happened to your mother. And that's when the light bulbs went off. I had manifested my mother's exact life. My mother left my father when in her mid thirties, I was leaving him in my mid thirties. My father had cheated on my mother and married another woman who was 16 years younger than my mother. My ex had married a girl who got back to marry, whatever. He, the girlfriend was 16 years younger than me. My mother had two kids. I had two kids. My, my mother had a six-year-old, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. I had a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. And literally everything, everything was identical. Now, instead of going down the path, now this is where I have to say I'm so thankful for books like Think and Grow Rich and Bob Proctor because I had the knowledge already Instead of becoming disempowered and thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm a victim, all the same, same things, tragedies happened to me. I became empowered. I thought, oh my God, if I manifested this and I am an educated woman who is a lawyer in the UK, has done, who became a self-made millionaire at 27 and did all of this. If I can throw all of that through the, to, the, to the wind and create a life to replica my mother in her similar age, what could I possibly manifest if I put my mind to it? That was seven years ago. And that was in 2017. Fast forward 2017, I now have multiple businesses in different sectors, coaching, property, investments. And of course, I've just launched another business in a business in manufacturing, steel manufacturing. And they're all in multiple seven figures. My kids have gone back to the private school, have, uh, have lived in a very nice home. We have nice holidays. I've created the life that I wanted by myself because I became empowered not disempowered when I realized I had manifested my mother's life. It just made me think, if I can create this, oh my God, what else could I could manifest if I put my mind to it and do it intentionally? You are amazing. You are just like a powerhouse coming in here. I just love all these stories and they come with such beautiful lessons and you're so eloquent with them, you know, and just explaining and transferring that positivity and that energy you have. You are on fire, Gul. I love it. Wow. I have so many other questions to go to. There's so many pieces here. Your intuition. I feel like you are so connected with your intuition. And do you feel that comes to you? I mean, because noticing like all these hits, you know, like that you're getting with, oh, well, my mom went through the exact same story. Boom. You got that intuitively. Wake up, 
I don't know why, but I have to go see where my husband's at. And boom, you find him in that. Fair. Like you follow the breadcrumbs that the universe, the God, that source spirit is sending your way. And to me, that's a way of spirit speaking to us through our intuition. You know, we manifest, we put things out there, but it's speaking back to us. And it seems like you're very connected. Talk to me about, is this something that came innate to you that you've developed throughout the years? You know, you've done all these courses of EFT and NLP and all these when you did that work on yourself, have you cultivated your intuition and you've learned about it? Was it innate? Do you think it was a, a balancing act with dyslexia? Like, how are you perceiving intuition in your life and how you're connecting to it? That's a great question. I don't know if dyslexia had a part to play, but I do believe dyslexia is a gift for me from God. I really do believe it is a gift. It allowed me to look, and it still does, allows me to look at things in a different way. I still struggle with handwriting. I still struggle with reading at times. And I have to focus and look at things differently. Um, I'm still a slow reader in comparison to where I should be. But I don't see that as a problem. I think dyslexia helps me to look at things differently because I have to for me to understand things. But having said that, I think that the intuition was there from the beginning. I think I've been very, intuition comes to you when you are connected to your spiritual side. I think that's the, people have to understand that. We are, it's not that I am more intuitive than somebody else. I'm just more in touch with my intuition than someone else. And the more you are in touch with your spiritual side, the more you'll be in touch with your intuition. And let me explain why I say that. Because most people with the, who focus on the five senses, and I was listening to Dr. Wayne Dyer recently, so I can remember listening to his book, Be Magic or Creating Magic or something along those lines. And he beautifully exemplified this, that if you are just a person who lives by their five senses, all they believe in what they can see, taste, taste and touch and whatever, then you are missing vast majority of your life because you're ignoring the vast majority of who you are. Yes, we are living in this physical 3D world and we are using our senses. But if we don't use our intuition, if you don't use our spirituality, we, we are living a half, if not even less than a half of our life, right? Now, intuition is in everyone. And what does intuition mean? And it means different things to different people. For me, intuition is God speaking to me, God guiding me, God showing me the way. The more you listen to that guidance, the louder the voice, this is something that Bob Proctor used to say, the more you listen to your intuition, the louder the voice gets. The less you listen to it, and as Dr. Wayne Dyer puts it, the less you are, the more you concentrate on listening to your physical senses, the intuition's still there, the guidance is still there. You're unable to hear it because it's so dimmed in, in terms of volume. The more you start putting emphasis on that, okay, what I don't hear, the whisper, you know, what's there, not the chatter, not the rubbish, not the, all the naysayers that you hear in your in your normal day-to-day -day life from the news, from the neighbors, from the everyone else but the actual whisper or conversation that's coming to you from your spirit, the dimmer the five senses get and the stronger the sense, the spiritual senses get, and that's your intuition. And usually, I learned this from my mother as well. She goes, if 100 people are doing one thing, do the opposite. Probably going to be right. And I remember reading this on one of my, it was so funny because my mother used to say these, because she was a big avid reader. She would say these things and I would later on read and I find out that same thing has been sent by some other author. I'm like, oh, wow, okay. So your intuition is going to give you things which is against the grain which is counterintuitive like okay how does it make sense for me to go this way I'm like everyone's doing this thing why am I doing this way but it makes sense for you because if you live through your five senses you're gonna go you know do what everyone else is doing and your life will go up incrementally slowly gradually if you start focusing on intuition that's when you take the quantum leaps forward it's impossible for Gull of 2017 who had no money to her name I got my first client the end of 2017 to know that in 2023 she would have been living here she would have the 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 kind of businesses I do be living the kind of life I do and would be I'm not saying life has been challenging there's been other challenges throughout I absolutely still are you know this whole part of living right but she wouldn't have the idea that this was possible for me. Yes, she did. I mean, obviously she dreamt it, so I made it. But it was still, if she lived on her senses, it made no sense. And for the average person, like, oh my God, you did so much. When I'm thinking, no, I haven't done enough. I'm still underachieved. I'm still hit, not hitting my targets. Oh my God, what are you talking about? But for average person, they're like, oh, you've done so well. Have I? I have to scratch my hands like, oh, yes, I have. Actually, I'm okay. <laughs> That's good. God, thank you for the reminder. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Alamia. Thank you, God. And let's carry on. 
So does that make sense? The intuition is there all the time for every single person. It's how much we listen to it. And I, because of my mother, I have to give credit to my mother. I've always been spiritual. She was a very, very spiritual lady. I have, my faith is very important to me. So I do pray. I pray my five daily prayers of being a Muslim. I am connected to God and I am speaking to God five times a day in my prayer, along with this fact that I'm doing my meditations and I'm talking to God even outside my prayers. I'm talking to him constantly. And because of that, I'm ready to receive the guidance when it comes to me. And it comes to me frequently. And I'm not saying I listen to it 100% of the time, but I would say I'm getting better at it every day. And I listen to it a lot more than I did when I was younger. And the more I listen to that guidance, the more I prosper. Now, hey, I want to add something else. People say, well, I listened to it, but it took me down the wrong path and I ended up you know, fumbling over. You may need to fumble over. You may need to fall down certain times. And sometimes you need to fall down on a smaller, you know, a smaller hill to avoid the larger mountain. And that lesson's being taught to you. Listen, look, do this now. So when you come to a bigger cliff, you won't fall off. You'll know how to guide yourself off that cliff. And this is a guidance teaching that universe gives you throughout. Sometimes your intuition is always right, but sometimes it doesn't work out the way you want it to. And you think, well, I listened to intuition and it work out. It did work out. You just haven't understood it because you haven't seen the bigger picture because we're too focused on that narrow one episode of our life. And if we take a step back and we actually do look back and look at the grander picture, which the universe can see, you will see how perfectly timed that was because you have so, something else which is amazing coming to you, which wouldn't come to you had you not gone through that experience. So intuition is always working. You just have to listen to it. Fabulous. Once again, so many things. I think we are going to have to do another episode with you, Gold, because I'm just like, oh my God, there's so many golden nuggets in here. And I have so many questions to ask. We're going to take one more pause and come back with some more intriguing questions. I'm sure Gold's going to tell us some more stories here. Are you looking for personal or professional growth? Would you like to turn this year's goals into a reality? If you answered yes, then you're going to want to go to the show notes and sign up for our four day event, the four proven principles of success. This event is free and it starts tomorrow, January 12th, and it goes until January 15th. You have all weekend to attend live or listen to the recordings. And during this event, you'll learn from experts and real people who have discovered abundance in their lives and business. You'll get to receive resources and implementation tools to further guide you in creating your dream business. And you will learn the key to attracting abundance and success into your life. You'll get to connect with like-minded individuals and be in a supportive network. So if you'd like to get access, all you have to do is get registered with the link in the show notes. And like Napoleon Hill says, a goal is a dream with a deadline. So take action and I will see you at our event. So, wow, intuition, you explained that so beautifully. And I love how you tapped into the different parts of either focusing on our 3D reality and our senses or connecting with what uh, Napoleon Hill talks in the book of our higher faculties, you know, like with intuition, imagination, will, there's so many of these aspects. And he also talks about faith. And I love how you've explained faith before too, no matter what religious beliefs everyone has, you know, like, I love that, you know, you're Muslim, that you pray five times a day, that you do your meditations. This is for everyone to listen and see how connected are you with your spirituality? How connected are you with that intuition? So you talk a lot about your mom and the gifts and the blessings that she's given you because you have that sense of awareness. Like I said, like I can, I can pick that up on you, Gold. What about, let's take it to the next generation. You've achieved all these successes. What are you teaching your kids? How old are them? And what are you passing down to them from all these things that you've learned? Oh, that's a fully loaded question as well. Yeah, um, I have two kids at the moment. I have a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old. I say at the moment because I do plan on adopting more kids. I, I do want to have more kids. And I'm not sure how that would transpire, but I want to make myself financially secure first before I take on as many kids I can. And at first I was thinking of one or two, but now I'm thinking because of what's happening in all these different countries, I will probably talk a lot more. And if there are in the war torn countries, making, getting them prosthetic limbs and whatever else and education, I just want to provide holistic care to loads of as many children as I can. That's my goal, my end goal anyway. So 
I want to pass on to those children the same, same things that I'm passing on to my kids, that nothing's impossible. Everything is possible. And now my daughter, more than my son, went through and experienced the, the trauma of my separation with, with her dad. And she doesn't, she's, she doesn't have a very good relationship with the father. He is a narcissist. And unfortunately, the narcissists do not make good, great parents. My son is the most gorgeous soul on the planet. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. His father doesn't turn up. He doesn't complain. He waits for him all day long. He doesn't turn up. He doesn't complain. My son, my daughter gets annoyed and gets very, very upset with him. But my son never complains. He's always happy to see his dad. He's always one of his people. So he still has a relationship with his dad. But both of them have learned that adversity is not your foe. And, you know, you can learn and develop through it. And I remember when I was going through some really tough time with a business deal and I was really struggling, really struggling. And I was really upset. And it took some a lot of time, a lot of money out of me. When you finally got it over the line and we did it, my son turned, uh, came to me and said, mom, I'm so proud of you. You know, well done for doing this. And that's my 12 year old. And he was just, it, and it made me realize my children are watching me struggle they, and behave and do things and they see me you know be success as well and then recently in the last week I got an award over there and my daughter came along and she saw me receiving that award now she said told me that she sat there admiring me all night I didn't know this at the time but she sat there admiring me all night people kept telling her how amazing I was and so forth but again those things she knows the fact that that's just what people are saying the struggle the hard work that went to it was behind the scenes so I think one thing I'm hoping, and I do believe I'm doing at the moment, is showing my kids that it doesn't matter what your dreams are, what you want to achieve, you put your hard work and a dedication into it and have faith. You can't do one or the other. You know, you, that comes from thinking, you know, that comes from you know, Wallace D. Wallace, you know, of, you know, the science of getting rich. There's a thinking stuff. You can't think one way and act in a different way. You have to th think in alignment with it. So thinking in a certain way. So as long as you do the hard work and dedication and believe and think in the right way, then the rewards come sooner or later. Sometimes our time scale is a lot faster than the universe's time scale, but we have to trust the process. And eventually you do. So she saw me getting the award. She saw me, you know, getting all the accolades and everything else. And but she's also seen my struggle. So I think what I'm teaching my children is have faith, believe in the impossible. And now I'm not going to share what her dream is. But my daughter shared with me recently a very, very lofty dream. And she said, do you think it's crazy? I'm like, no, you believe in yourself and you and it. Absolutely, you can do this. And I'm fully supporting her. She's going out and going for it. Whether she achieves it or not, it's neither here nor there. The fact that she had the ability to dream and believe she could do that, I think I've done my job. Brava. I want to just commend you on that one too. And you just... Another quote from the book from Napoleon Hill, you know, it's what, whatever the mind can conceive and believe the mind can achieve. So I'm sure your daughter will get it. Like you said, it, that's not the point. But if she's applying the formula, most likely it'll end up coming her way too. You are a fantastic mother. I just have to commend you. And may we all learn everything that you're teaching us, you know, indirectly with your stories here on this podcast. Wow. Amazing. Before we wrap up, I know our time's limited. Like I said, I'd love to have you back gold because you are full of lessons. Yeah. One thing that just stood out for me, as you were saying that you want to adopt children and especially kids, you know, in troubled areas and supporting, I see that humanitarian side in you and that wanting to give back. And so it almost tears me up because I resonate with it. How important is it? to create that journey of making money. Yes, it's choking me up of just thinking of this because we are so powerful as human beings. And I see your power as a woman and everything that you've created and manifested and the dreams that you have of helping other kids and other children, you know, whether it's adopting them, helping them with other things. How important is it for us, the listeners, to be on that path of generating money dissolving those money blocks because money is a tool. I hate when people say that money's evil or it's the root of all evil or people that no, have not. money are corrupt, you know, like I'm just, money is cool. yeah, money is neutral. You're such an example, you know, of like, look what you can do and look what you can dream to pursue when you have money, when you've taken care of yourself, when your basic needs are taken care of. And now let's make more money so that we can help more people. 
talk to us about that goal, please. I think everyone has to have a goal that's bigger than themselves. So when I first started out in 2017, my goal was, and some people may laugh at this, I my because I grew up in the slums of UK in East London, my goal was my kids are going to go to private school. So when my kids were pulled out of private school in 2017, I was devastated. I was crying because I could live in a small house and everything. Nothing else mattered. The cars didn't matter. Nothing mattered. But my kids' education mattered to me. So at that time, the goal was getting my kids into back into the schools. And I did that within a year. So my Myra was out of private school for a year. My son was out of private school for two years. And that's so then they were back into private education. That was my goal, making sure my kids are fine. They're getting education. They're getting a good lifestyle. And I've created all of that within the last seven years. But that's been great. Now, I am the most one of the most ambitious people you will ever meet. And I'm really driven in terms of what I want to create. And if you should look at my needs and my desires, they're so basic. Like even now I have more than too much. I have too much. I don't need this much. I live so simply. I have look, no jewelry, no fancy things at all. I'm so simple in terms of what my needs are to make me happy because I don't see money can make me happy directly. However, I value and respect money a lot because I think money is really can be used powerfully to help those who are not in the position to create money that you are, Naya. I used to believe everyone create money. The truth of the matter is, at certain circumstances, people are not. If they're in war countries or if they're stuck in a difficult situation or they don't have educate, access to education, they're not at that point where they can even know the fact that they can create money. And they, then the onus lies on people like you and I who have the awareness, who have living in this, you know, in uh, developed countries or in countries where we have the freedom to choose what we can do, do it freely, and we can create enough abundance, not just for ourselves and our kids and my kids' kids. Because I think by the time I'm finished, and I don't think I'll finish until the day I die, whenever that is, I will, I'm not saying I will not leave my kids something. Yes, I will leave something for my kids and I will leave legacy for my kids' kids as well. So my kids and my kids' kids. So generational wealth I will create. But that's not, that can't be my end goal. I can't be a Rothschild. I cannot be doing this so that 10 generations down the line, you know, my kids are billionaires. That's not my goal. That would not make me happy. What's going to make me happy is my kids are taken care of. They are well-educated, that they are able to create wealth for themselves. That's the first point. But more importantly, for me to, I even see this and I can say it so passionately because I know I have this vision now. I want to create so much wealth that I can go and live in or at least part of my life be in these areas where they need a motherly love. They need to have that education. They need to have, you know, the prosthetic limbs. If they, you know, for kids who had limbs thrown off and whatever else, it sounds awful, but I don't want to be part of the problem. I don't want to be part of the hate. I want to be part of the solution. So yes, this rubbish is going on. I don't know how it's going to fix it and what's going to happen with all this rubbish that's going on in the world at the moment. I don't want to focus on that problem. We'll figure a proper solution out and it will sort it out. But I want to be part of the solution where I go in and I create those schools. I create those hospitals. I create those environments where children, women, people can get the help they need. And especially children, they can get their education. So if some child doesn't have limbs, they can still get the education so they can fend for themselves and they can become a contributing member of the society. You don't need to have limbs to be a contributing member of the society. You need to have the right mindset for me to give that mindset to the children. And if someone has, for example, a man has, you know, do that for older people as well. But my goal is for the next generation because that's our future. If I can take 10 children who don't have parents, who don't have maybe limbs because something's happened to them, whatever, you know, we, we own wars, all sorts of things happen. And I can bring them up and give them the right, you know, make sure medical attention so they have the limbs, they're able to be self-sufficient and give them the education and the mindset and the ability to believe in themselves so that they can go and create God, you know, 10 Elon Musks, you know, from themselves, you know, who, know, who knows what they can create. That's my legacy to the world. And the millions that I'll make can be spent on those 10 children will be well spent because I'm not taking anything to my grave. I think there's a difference with where, where people forget that we are here for a limited time and we don't take anything with us in the next life. Being a Muslim, I'm going to be, if I'm lucky and I die in you know, a normal way, I will be wrapped around in a white shroud and put into earth. That's it. That's my end. doesn't matter if I have billions in the bank account or trillions in the bank account. Nothing goes with me. Not even the, these clothes on my back. Nothing goes with me. No cars, no money, no jewelry, nothing, nothing. So the only thing that I will leave behind is the legacy. What's going to be my legacy? My legacy is going to be, even if I help one child or 10 children, a woman who came, who left the world a better place than she found it. 
And my goal, or my way of doing that is through helping children, animals, anyone. I love animals too. So whatever can, but my, my focus would be, with my money would be going to these places, these worn form places and give a mother's love to those children who don't have parents and those children who may have lost hope and give them hope and make them realize nothing's happening to them. Everything happened for them and they could be better people and they could be, something better can come from it. And that comes from my faith. Brava. Brava. Amazing. Woof. That was so much goal. Cool. You are an incredible soul. And where can people find you? That's great. So the best place to find, actually, we've got two places now. And I don't know if you have a link, whatever. I will share that link with you, Tanya. This, you can find me on my podcast, which is Money Mindset with Gul Khan. And I love interviewing. I've interviewed Tanya before on my podcast too. So come and find me on my podcast and listen to the various conversations that I have. And the other thing is we have launched a new community on school platform, which is Sam Owens platform, and people can get free resources there. So we have free energy tools and energy clearings and one of my famous Millie in the Mirror meditation there as well. So come and join me in my community and I'm there all the time. So we sort of hang out there. I moved away from Facebook and other things. So I've just gone into this community. And uh, so I'm paying for it. It's a paid one, but you guys get it for free. So it's a free community for you guys. Come and join on this amazing platform and have a conversation with me. There. Thank you. We'll have both of those on the show notes so that you can look for goal and jump into her world because wow, what an amazing human being. As we finish up, one last question, goal. What's the most important principles from Napoleon Hill's work that you'd have our listeners focus on? Self-belief. It's the very first one we discussed. I stumbled on it accidentally I didn't know it was one of the main themes of his book but it really is we haven't discussed something else which is also the mastermind principle I think surrounding yourself with the right people I believe that's important but that comes second the very first thing that you need to understand the very the most important principle is self-belief believing in yourself have a goal and then believe that you can do it. And if you don't have the belief build that belief by doing self-talk in the mirror doing meditation whatever works for you Mirror work is probably the most powerful, most profound for me, and maybe is for loads of other people. But do something like that to build that self-confidence, to believe that belief in yourself, because that will get you everywhere. And I remember that there's a thing that, you know, the Albert Einstein used to say, you know, thinking will get you somewhere, but imagination will get you everywhere, you know? So use your imagination to see where you want to go and then build a belief that you can and will get there. And you will. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. I love you. Thank you so much, Gold, for your presence and for all the wisdom that you've imparted with us today. Thank you so much. I am so grateful that you joined me today. If you enjoyed it, there's one thing I'd like you to do. Click on the follow button so you don't miss a single episode. Leave me a rating and a review and please share. As my way to thank you, Email us a screen grab of your review at the email in the show notes, and we will send you a free Crafting Your Future guided visualization, which is so simple to do with outstanding results. It will empower you and give you the confidence to attract and create the life you've always desired. See you in our next episode.